1 Corinthians chapter 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does no justice, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in the mirror, dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know, just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this good word. Lord, we thank you for this call to love. Lord, we just pray Lord, that you would use this time, Lord. You would use the message that Pastor has prepared to go stir up this love in our hearts. So, love for you, which will just flow out into love, loving others too, Lord. So, we just pray that you would work your miracle by the Holy Spirit in our hearts this time. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Love. It is all about love. What an amazing passage. Uh, a passage which we often read at weddings. Uh, and even in kind of non-Christian weddings, sometimes, you know, even people who aren't believers, this is often a passage which they turn to. A famous passage which is all about love. And it is a privilege and a pleasure to explore this theme together as a church. Because you see, as Paul says, without love, you and I are nothing. Now, what an incredible statement that is. The context of Paul making this statement, he is addressing the Corinthian church. As we've seen, this is a church who are, they're full of pride and they've got other issues as well. And he reminds them that it's not about how smart you are, right? If you remember earlier on, they kind of prided themselves in their wisdom, in their knowledge. But Paul says it's not about how smart you are. He says it's not about how gifted you are. And we've been looking at that the last couple of weeks about these spiritual gifts. But Paul says it's not about how gifted you are. If you're missing love, you're nothing. Love is the integral ingredient. It's all about love. And this is the more excellent way that Paul spoke about at the end of the previous chapter. And if you remember, after looking at the amazing spiritual gifts that God gives us to bless one another... Paul then calls us not to forget love. Because as uh, one pastor, a guy called uh, Chuck Smith, he says this, Without love, all the gifts and the powers of the Holy Spirit are meaningless and worthless. Let me say that again. Without love, all the gifts and powers of the Holy Spirit are meaningless and worthless. And my heart and desire this afternoon is that we would all go away realising that we are called to be individuals, but also as a church, a community of believers, we are called to be guided, defined, motivated and filled 
with love. So, do you have love? Are you a person of love? Are we a church of love? Our text begins in verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. There seem to have been those within the Corinthian church who they prided themselves in their ability to speak in tongues. They had the gift of supernaturally speaking a language not their own and and Paul challenges them. He says, hey, if, if you don't have love, your ability, your gifting to speak in tongues is meaningless. Whether earthly languages, heavenly languages, languages of angels, it is meaningless without love. It's just a noise. And he uses the illustration of a a brass instrument or a clanging cymbal. Now, the latter of those I know very well. Uh, For about five years, I worked in a, a drum department of a music shop, as some of you will know. And our room, it was located right at the back of the shop. I want you to kind of picture this room and in this room on multiple walls we had different symbols for people to see, people to try out. Now most people they would maybe give them a little tap you know and they would ask hey can I take this down can I try this out in the demo room and we'd be like yeah sure sure thing let me give you a hand but occasionally you would get a kid actually sometimes not even a kid sometimes an adult but sometimes you'd get a kid they've got hold of a stick and they decide to go along the wall, hitting multiple symbols as hard as they can. Often this happens while their parent is watching gleefully. Oh, isn't that, oh, isn't it great? (laughs) And us as staff members are gritting our teeth and praying that the day will come to a quick end. And as the child is going along, it's all noise. Just noise, horrible noise. This is what it's like to have the gift of tongues without love. If someone was to ask you the question, hey, what is the greatest uh, sign or the clearest sign of the Spirit's work in a person's life? This is a rhetorical question, but if somebody was to ask you that question, what would be your response? What would you say, ah, that's clear evidence that the Spirit's at work in their life? What would you say? Well, Paul would say the greatest sign of the Spirit's work in a person's life is not whether they speak in tongues or not, not whether they prophesy or not, or have gifts of healing or not. No. The greatest sign is love. Are they growing in love? If you desire to speak in tongues, great. But do you desire love more? Because love is a more excellent way. And when we get that right, all the spiritual gifts will find their right place and their right expression. As Paul continues on, it isn't just tongues that is nothing without love, but rather all spiritual gifts. And though I have, this is verse 2, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so I could remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. Prophecy without love is nothing. But it's the those next kind of two phrases that he says, which really challenged me personally, because he says, if you had all knowledge and all understanding about everything, but love was missing, you're nothing. Now think about it for a second. To understand all mysteries and to have all knowledge, to understand everything, is what? It is 
ultimately to understand the truth about God and mankind. In other words, to understand all mysteries and knowledge is to have correct theology, correct doctrine. This is a good thing. And yet, if love is missing, I have serious issues. Now church, I want us to be men and women who know the words, who have good theology to, to the extent that we can. Obviously, later when he talks about us knowing in part, there are some things our minds aren't going to be able to comprehend. But I want us to be men and women who have good theology, who know the word, who are growing in the word, but we also at the same time need to understand if love is missing, we've missed the whole point. If love is missing, we're nothing. It reminds me of the rebuke that Jesus gives in Revelation to the church of Ephesus. Um, so if you've got a Bible, feel free to turn to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 2. So the very last book of the Bible, Re Revelation. Oh, sorry, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 2. What do we read? We read this to the church in Ephesus. I know your works, your labour, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have laboured for my name's sake, and have not become weary, nevertheless. I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. The initial write-up is great. Right? The first part of the text is great. I mean, I mean, who wouldn't want to be part of this church? Right? They've laboured, they've endured, they've persevered, they know the word, they don't tolerate unsound doctrine. But then comes the rebuke. Because there's something missing. And what is it that's missing? It's love. They had left their first love. Who was their first love? love Jesus now I don't think that they had intellectually intellectually speaking left their first love because it says that they labored for his name's sake but rather it was their love for him that was missing love was missing from this church and this is how important love is. Like Jesus would rebuke the church which had the sound doctrine and yet was missing love. And Paul doesn't stop there. He says you could be full of faith to the point that you, you're literally moving mountains. But if you don't have love, it's meaningless, it's nothing. And then he says this, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Sacrificial work and labour within ministry is nothing without love. Sell all that you have, give to the poor, become a missionary, to the far reaches of the world, die on the front line of faith, being martyred for the name of Jesus, and you could have all of that. And yet, if you do not have love, it will profit you nothing. So, of all those different areas, here's a question. Which, which are you? Which of these areas do you find yourself valuing above love? 
Which of these areas do you say, hey, this is the sign of a true Christian. This is what it means to truly walk with the Lord. Do you value the physical manifestations of the Spirit? Do you value correct doctrine and knowledge? Do you value sacrificial service? Which one do you lean towards? Whichever one you lean towards, what you need to know is this. Love is better. Love is greater. Without love, all these things, which are good in and of themselves, these are great things, but without love, they mean nothing. And yes, we want to be people who are open to the gifts of the Spirit. We want to be people who have sound doctrine. We want to be people who are full of faith. We want to be people who are laying down our lives in service for the King of Kings. But we also need to know that without love, these things mean nothing. Love is greater. And if we get love right, I believe that we will find ourselves flourishing in these other areas that God intended. I don't think it's necessarily an either or, but rather as we pursue love, as we ask God to fill us with his love, as we become men and women of love, we will find ourselves naturally in these other areas serving and loving the Lord and others. So, with that all said, if love is greater than all these things, and if love is so important, we need to have a correct understanding of love. We need to know what love is if it's so important, right? And God has not left us to guess about such an important area. Instead, he has revealed to us what is love? And as we open the word of God, we read of what true love is. And the first thing which is helpful to understand is that true love, as described in the word of God, is vastly different to what love is in the world's eyes. As believers, we need to understand that and contend for that. The word love is thrown around by our culture. But what our culture means by love is very different from what God has declared is love. And so, not leaving us to guess what love is, God reveals to us what it is. And this is one of the places where he reveals what love is through what Paul writes here when he says this in verse 4, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. This is what love looks like. And there are some other things which we'll look at a bit later on as well. But this is where Paul starts. He describes what love looks like and he starts with patience. Love is patient. Or as we see here, translated by the New King James, which I find, I think is very helpful, it says love suffers long. That is what it means to be patient. It means to be willing to suffer a long time for the sake of the other. This is what true love looks like. You see, love is not directed or guided or governed by what is most comfortable and convenient for me. Let me say that again. Love is not directed or guided or governed by what is most comfortable and convenient for me. Rather, true love is willing to endure being uncomfortable, to endure the inconvenient. Love is willing to suffer long. Love doesn't bail when things get difficult. 
love patiently endures. The next thing Paul tells us is, is that love is also kind. Love displays itself in kindness towards others. So if you find yourself being unkind to someone, that is a clear sign that that is not love. Love does not envy. To envy is to covet something which someone else has. It is to have a strong, a passionate desire, a zeal, but in a negative sense, over something someone has which you don't in essence to be jealous over it's like i see that this person has something which i want that doesn't necessarily have to be like a physical object but it could be they could have something their body they could have something physically that you want or personality or position or certain relationships that they have It's not just a case of limited to maybe physical things like a car or something that they have, but rather it's anything that they have and you say to yourself, I I want that. And then passion and zeal rises in your heart in a negative sense, in a negative way. Jerry Bridges, he explains it this way, envy is the painful and oftentimes resentful awareness of an advantage enjoyed by someone else. Sometimes we want that same advantage, leading to the further sin of covetousness. And sometimes we just resent the other person having something we don't have. To envy envy is to have an, an awareness of an advantage that someone has, something which we want, we don't have and therefore we cover after it or we just simply resent the other person because they have what we don't. That is what is called envy and Paul says love doesn't do that. Love doesn't act in that way. That isn't love. Love does not look at what others have and respond in envy. That is not Love. Love also doesn't parade itself. Other translations will say love doesn't boast in itself or vaunt itself. And I like the way uh, that we see it translated here because it's very visual. To boast in oneself is to parade oneself. It is to shine the spotlight on us. It's like, hey, check me out. Now imagine throwing a parade for yourself. I know we don't see many parades here, but in other countries we do. I guess we do, we see, you know, carnivals and things like that, I guess. But imagine throwing a parade for you. And you look at your calendar and you're like, you know what? November 12th, it sounds like a great day to have a parade. Parade for me. And imagine you've got all the musicians, you've got the dancers, you've got the marchers, you've got the different floats, you've got the balloons, you've got this grand procession. Imagine through the streets of London, all the crowds have gathered and the purpose of this parade is for you, all for you. Love doesn't do that. And ultimately, what does a parade do? What does boasting do? It ultimately makes it all about me. It's all about me. Me, 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 me. Love doesn't do that. Love doesn't make it all about me. And the next description is kind of linked to that, right? Because love is not puffed up. Like literally, love doesn't inflate itself. It's not proud. Paul continues on. It it does not behave rudely. And then, one of the most challenging aspects of true love, which we 
I kind of just touched on is this, which is kind of the opposite of parading yourself, is this. Love doesn't seek its own. And I so said they're kind of linked to the, you know, love doesn't parade itself. Love doesn't seek its own. Love says it's not all about me. Love says I'm not solely seeking what's best for me. Love says I'm not seeking my own. Love says I'm seeking what's best for you. In our relationships, in our friendships, in our family, in because ultimately that's where we see love displayed most is going to be between us and other people. In our relationships, are we seeking our own? Or are we seeking the good of the other person? Love is not easily provoked. And that basically means love just isn't easily stirred up in a negative sense. Love thinks no evil. So love is pure. And I think this is really uh, important to know that love thinks no evil. Basically, when we speak of love, there is a moral aspect to love. As in, when we think about love and acts of love, we cannot separate love from morality, what is good and what is evil, because here Paul says they're intrinsically linked. You see, love doesn't even think evil. Love is pure, which means to do an act which is morally wrong, an act which the Bible calls out as morally wrong, is not loving. Because love doesn't even think evil. Um, And Paul kind of continues this same stream of thought in verse 6, where he says this, Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. What is iniquity? Well, basically, iniquity is, is sin. Love doesn't rejoice in sin. What is sin? Well, sin is anything, whether in, uh, in, in, in our heart, in our motives, in our thoughts, in our actions, in our words, anything which goes against what God has declared as right and wrong. Or, and, and, and that kind of includes things that we, as I say, things that we do think or say, our motives, our actions, our heart. It's also things that we fail to do. So sins of omission, when we're meant to do something, but we don't do it. Basically, love doesn't rejoice in sin. And I think this is perhaps one of the biggest signs that what is described as love in our culture is not love because it rejoices in sin. Now let's take, for example, how our culture approaches love in the area of romance. Now love is not limited to romance. I think sometimes that's where we go wrong in our culture. We think of love primarily in the romantic sense, but love is is beyond just love within a a romantic relationship. But for example, let's take our culture and how it approaches the area of romance. You see, our culture rejoices in people sleeping together outside of marriage. And our culture rejoices in romance between those of the same gender, those of the same sex. And this kind of culminates in our culture having this banner, and perhaps you've seen it, it's it's in billboards, it's sometimes around. It's basically the banner of our culture's belief on love is summed up in this statement, love is love. That's kind of what our culture stands for, love is love. I mean, you could ask, what on earth does that mean? (laughs) The Urban Dictionary is there to help us. 
Love is love. When people say that within our culture, this is what they mean. Love is love, a phrase meaning that love expressed by an individual or couple is valid regardless of the sexual orientation or gender identity of their lover or partner. So that's what our culture means by love is love. But what does scripture say? Well, what we have, what we just read, right? We've just read that love doesn't rejoice in sin. So if the Bible says that sex is to be between one man and one woman in covenantal marriage, and that when we take sex outside of that context, it becomes sin, then that which our culture prides itself in is not love at all. You see, love is not whatever you want it to be. Love was created and therefore defined by the one who created it. The one who is love and that is God. God created love and God is love. And therefore, when it comes to the area of love, we can't just say, well, love is love. No, we come to God and we say, God, you know what love is because you are love. So God, you teach me what love is. Love does not rejoice in sin, but look what it does rejoice in. Isn't it Paul, right? So here's love. Love doesn't rejoice in sin. Okay, so this is a great clue. If you're doing something which is, the Bible says, is sinful, it may feel good to you, but it's not love. But look at what love does rejoice in. Love rejoices in truth. Love and truth go hand in hand. Love and truth go hand in hand. This is why we can't just say, God is a God of love. We need to explain what that actually, why God is a God of love and what that looks like. Because it goes hand in hand with truth, love and truth go hand in hand. We need to realise that. And then we come to this in verse 7. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So love bears, believes, hopes, and endures all things. Now, one commentator explains it this way, which I think is very helpful. It says this, the terms believe and hopes are sandwiched in between bears and endures. Like them, they probably refer to relationships between people rather than to faith and hope in God. Love believes the best of others and hopes the best for them. So what it explains is, look, in terms of bears all things and endures all things, we would use that in terms of how we relate to other people, right? We don't need to bear or endure with God. God's perfect, right? But rather we have to bear and endure with each other because we're broken, we're sinful people, we hurt each other. That's why true love is called to bear and endure. Sandwich in between bears and endures is believes and hopes all things. Now, believes all things doesn't mean that it's okay to believe anything, that there isn't a right or a wrong, that there isn't a truth, right? We've just read that. Love and truth, right? They go hand in hand because love rejoices in truth, right? Paul isn't saying here, hey, believe anything. He's not saying all roads lead to Jesus. That's not true. He doesn't say all roads lead to God. That's not true. 
He's not saying that. Love is not universalism which says, hey, God, lo- God is happy with you doing whatever you want. All roads lead to Rome, all roads lead to God. That's not the message of the Bible. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. God, the God of love, is very clear. There's only one way to him and he's provided that way and that is Jesus. So when Paul says, look, believes all things, he's not saying just believe what you want. But rather, what I think that commentator is spot on with is this, is that love believes the best of others. When we love people, we say, you know what, I'm, I am believing the best for you. It's just, in essence, I've not written you off, but rather I'm going to hold on, I'm going to believe that God is able to do the best for you. And, and likewise, kind of linked to that is, and hopes the best for them. So true love says, you know what, I, I believe the best for you and I'm hoping the best for you. And I'm not doing that because I'm great. But rather, I believe the best for you and I hope the best for you because of Jesus. Because I worship a God who is able to do the impossible. I have hope for this friendship, for this relationship. I have hope for you. Because love bears, love believes, love hopes, and love endures all things. Because love never fails. Now I'm just going to read through these next few verses um, just for sake of time. I'm not going to be able to unpack all of them because I ultimately want to spend a little bit of time thinking about, okay, we've had this great call to love, but how do we actually go and do it? But let's just briefly read through these verses and, and, and God willing, uh, next time we speak on it, I'll be able to unpack some of it a bit more. But verse 8 says this, love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I fought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly but then face to face now I know in part but then I shall know just as I am all that just as I also am know now we're not going to dive in we're not going to unpack everything within this passage but a couple people in essence interpret this passage a couple different ways we all agree that this passage clearly says that there's going to be a day when prophecies seek cease and when tongues cease so some believe that when he refers to uh when it says when that which is perfect has come some people believe that that would that is the canon of scripture so once the canon of scripture was was done and sorted in essence there would come a time when tongues and prophecies would cease the other opinion is this is that when he's referring to the perfect has come he's referring to jesus I personally lean towards the latter of the two, mainly because in verse 12 he says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. That there, a couple verses later, is clearly talking about when we see Jesus face to face. So my personal opinion on that is that there's going to come a time when prophecies and tongues cease, and that's when we go to be with him. That's when we see him face to face. And, but whatever side you fall on within that, we can all agree, agree that prophecies and tongues will end, will cease. Whether you believe they have ceased already or whether you believe they will one day cease, we all agree they're temporary. But there is something which is not temporary and that's love. Don't you ever think about it. Love is going to last forever. These other gifts 
They have a time limit on them. Verse 13, he says, And now abide faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. I mean, faith remain, hope remain, love remain, but the greatest of these is love. You see, when we go to be with Jesus face to face, when we're united with him face to face, when he brings everything to a conclusion and those who put their faith and trust in him, we go to be with him, we see him face to face, we spend eternity with him. Think about it, right? In some ways, faith ceases because faith is the conviction of things unseen. Where if I'm face to face with Jesus, I'm now seeing that thing I had a conviction about, right? And even hope. Likewise, you're hoping for something which is yet to take place. But when you go to see him face to face, it is taking place. That which you hope for is now happening. But love, love doesn't end when we see Jesus face to face, but rather it continues for all eternity. Love is eternal. You see, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit have been in a loving community for all eternity. Love has already, always existed and, it, and God is love. And that, and that is one of the reasons why the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity is so beautiful because we believe in one God, three persons. God can only be love if there is an object for him to love, Right? There ha- in order to be loved, there has to be somebody to love. Well, God in his eternal triune nature has always been loved because the Father, Son and Holy Spirit have been in this loving relationship for all eternity. And then they decide to create us. And they invite us to be a part of that loving relationship for all eternity. And that's what eternity is going to look like. It's going to look like us loving Jesus perfectly. It's going to look like us loving each other perfectly. Eternity is going to be all about love. Us loving him, us being loved by him, us loving others. And that is why Paul says, and now abide faith, hope, Love these three, but the greatest of these is love. So, having spent the past half an hour thinking about love, you're like, Dan, I get it. Love's important. Man, I need love, and this is what love looks like. But how do, how do I do it? How do we love? Now, I would be doing you a massive disservice if I simply just said to you, be more loving, guys. Go out there. Be more loving. Come on, pull up your shoes, put some effort into it. Be more loving. I guarantee you, if you try to do it that way, you're going to fail. We do not have the strength and capacity within ourselves to make us the kind of loving people we're called to be. But God didn't leave us to do it on our own. Listen to this verse, right? This is Romans 5.5. 5. You know, if you've got a Bible or a highlighter, you like to highlight Bibles, then, then this is definitely a passage to highlight. Paul says this in Romans 5.5, 5, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Romans 5, 5. We've not been left to do it on our own. God has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And one of the main things that he does is he pours. It's not sprinkle, it's not a little drip, but rather he pours the love of God into our hearts. You see, 
the only way in which we can be the kind of men and women who are defined by love is if we are men and women who are empowered by the Holy Spirit. You see, it is through the Holy Spirit that God's love, which is far greater than our own, is poured out into us. And as it is poured out into our hearts, we are then able to then share that love with others. We love because he first loved us. So he loves us. He has loved us by dying on a cross in our place. And for those who then accept that love, he then pours his love into us so that we can then begin to love others as he has loved us. You see, the way in which we become more loving is by getting on our knees and saying, Jesus, fill me with your love and then may I overflow to others. Holy Spirit, give me your love that I can love others. Because love is a fruit of the Spirit. This is what Galatians, you know, Galatians, the beautiful list. Galatians 5 and, chapter, uh, and verse 22, I think it is. Galatians 5, 22, 23 says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. What is the fruit, one of, what is the, fruit of the Spirit? Well, the first, the first thing he says is love. Now, we could wrongly think of that list of, okay, I've got to make sure I'm more loving, more joyful, more peaceful. Right, this week, I'm going to be more kind. I'm going to be more faithful. I'm going to be more gentle. Those things listed are a fruit of the Spirit, which basically means they are a result of the Spirit. When we are walking with the Spirit, this, will, this is what will ensue. And of these things that will ensue, is love. As we walk with Jesus daily, as we walk with the Spirit daily, a fruit of that is love. So this week, what, first and foremost, my desire for you and for me is this. First of all, pray. It's like, man, I, I want to be a person of love, so first of all, God, reveal areas I need to repent of. Lord, forgive me for the times I've elevated this above love. Oh, I've elevated this above love, God. Forgive me. And the second thing is this, God, fill me with your love. God, help me understand more of your love. Give me more of your love. Lord, empower me to love others. This is what I want us to do this week. First and foremost, primarily, let us pray, get on our knees, because we cannot love the way he's called us to love without his empowering. So that's the first thing I want us to do. And then the second thing is to ask, okay, God, are there practical things I can do in this? Trusting that as I both ask for your help and act, you're going to be faithful to step in. We shouldn't just have just doing acts of love. Right? Because true love it needs to be more than just doing the right thing. And that's why it's a combination of, I pray, empower me, and then Jesus, okay, I'm now going to try and step out. Maybe, and some of those things are doing acts, like doing like acts of kindness. That's like a, a physical act. So I'm like, Jesus, fill me with your love, empower me to love, and then Jesus, I want to now try and step out practically. God, help me to love other people. And part of it's going to be repenting as well. It's like, oh man, I messed up in this relationship again. I wasn't being loving here. So God, forgive me, change me, empower me. Ah, oh, you know what? I wasn't being patient with that person. You know what? I was thinking it just about me in that situation. You know what? I was actually celebrating sin in that situation. God, forgive me. God, change me. So this week, let us Come to him daily and be like, Jesus, help me to love. And part of that is also going to be us just being in his word. 
1 John 3.16, so 1 John 3.16 says this, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for one another. God is love. The greatest display of that love was at the cross. So as we receive his love, as we are filled by his love with the Holy Spirit, as we are walking with him daily, as we see and are constantly reminded of the gospel which points to his love, he then begins to change us, to become men and women who love others. Uh, Let us pray together and then we'll take communion as we remember the greatest love of all displayed at the cross, which enables us to now love others. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this text. Lord, we thank you that you are a God of love and we thank you, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit, we can be empowered to love others as well. So Lord Jesus, I pray, please forgive us for the times where we have not loved, where we failed to love. This week, Lord, but beyond this week, Jesus, Lord, forgive us for those moments. And Lord Jesus, we do pray, fill us anew with your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, please may you pour out your love into our hearts that it would overflow, that we would love others. So God, I pray that this week, Lord, we wouldn't just try and buckle down and make this stuff happen ourselves but rather we would daily come to you humbly and dependent God crying out for you to fill us again that we could continue to love and Lord that as we do that Lord may we not forget the love that you've displayed to us we never move away from the gospel we just move deeper into it Jesus because the gospel is the greatest act of love So Lord, we thank you that you've loved us so dearly. Now empower us to love others the same way. In your name we pray, amen.